Hey everyone, welcome to the Redefining Work podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt. And if you are somebody who's curious about data, numbers, analytics, anything in that realm, this episode is definitely for you. So I'm joined today by Dr. Serena Huang. She is the founder of Data with Serena. She has a as deep of a background in people analytics as you'll find and uh, and a lot more. So Serena, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I'd love to have you open up with uh, an introduction for the Redefiners. Of course. Thank you so much for having me, Lars. It's so great to be on the show and get a chance to share my passion around people analytics with everyone. Um, I recently started my own company, Data with Serena, which is short for Learn to Love Data with Serena, but that's too long, so we'll keep it short um, because this chapter of my, my life is really about knowledge sharing. It's about spreading um, my experience and, and lessons learned with broader audience. I was formerly global head of people analytics at companies like PayPal, Kraft Heinz, GE, to name a few. Um, so, so yeah. That's a lot of experience that I now hope to share with people from how to craft a story that's really compelling with data to how to stand up your people analytics function if you're just starting. Um, I even now starting to talk to CEOs about should they have a people analytics function? Should they have a data-driven CHRO? What does that look like? Um, so I've really enjoyed my short journey so far as an entrepreneur and, uh, and continue to share knowledge on LinkedIn as well. So yeah. great to be yeah. here. I mean, speaking of LinkedIn, uh, also a LinkedIn learning instructor on people yes. analytics. So as you go through at the end yeah. of this podcast, you're like, I need more Serena that you can do that. You can hop in LinkedIn learning and there's some great right. courses that can educate you as well. Um, before we get into, you know, kind of your current state around the work you do in people analytics, I want to go back to the beginning. Like where did that passion for, numbers, data, analytics come from? When did you know that this was a path that you wanted to pursue? I don't know if there was a moment. I think people analytics found me. Uh, I didn't find people analytics because I started uh, my occasional training in economics and I focused on labor economics, which is you know human capital. Um, so very data focused kind of degree. And as I got out of grad school, um, I started in consulting. Actually, my first very fun job that was data focused was a labor and employment litigation consultant. <laughs> If you don't know what that is, uh, you can look it up. It's fascinating. But think about the person, the economist that they put on the stand when companies are facing class action lawsuits on pay discrimination or inequity and, and so on. So I was part of the team that would crunch the numbers, if you will, with sophisticated models um, to, to calculate you know, how, how much the damage was and so on. And so that's a very different type of work than I think probably most people are familiar with and certainly what I went to graduate school for. Um, so I got my hands on really people data at that point. This is you know, HR data from all kinds of systems and, and definitely reinforce my passion for the people side. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, fast forward a few years, I was a consultant at Deloitte and G had called and said they were standing up HR analytics and wanted me to be part of it because I knew data. And I thought, gosh, I don't think those two words don't go together again. This is like many, many years ago. Uh, and I also didn't know anything about HR. Um, but the, um, you know, I met the leadership team and they said, we well, want someone who is passionate, interested in people and know the number stuff. We will teach you the HR, you know, uh, fundamentals if you joined us. And I thought, wow, well, that sounds like a good deal. And if I don't like it, I could always go back to Deloitte or other companies to be a consultant. Um, and I've never looked back. I really enjoy being the in-house person, if you will, mm -hmm. compared to a consultant. Um, I was able to learn so much more about the company. And, um, and that's kind of where my passion for people data started. Um, and then, you know, quickly in the company, uh, G was where I started my people analytics journey. I was able to see how simple data analytics can make a huge impact from things like understanding 
recruiting process where slowdown happens by creating a chart that has a funnel, <laughs> as simple as that, where you know where bottlenecks are in the recruiting process. That was mind blowing for a lot of people, again, right, many years ago. But if you know talent acquisition candidate data, you know how messy it is and you know how much work it actually involves to create a funnel of any sort. So um, so I think it's simple examples like that, along with looking at retention. Where do people go? Um, where do you have attrition issues and, and, and all of that? I think that's kind of where being able to see initially very quickly, simple analysis can translate into actionable insight and the business cared. Um, that's kind of what kept me going for, for many years to come. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I think that, you know, you, what's interesting about your background is you were leading corporate people analytics teams and functions before people analytics kind of became this, <laughs> you know, trending team and topic. Obviously now yes. it's a fundamental compa- component yeah. of modern people teams. Um, and I think when you, when you look at, um, the spectrum, I think, of how HR and people teams uh, use people analytics. You know, on the one side, and obviously p- places like PayPal and GE and organizations where you worked, you, you, had, you have, you know, teams, dedicated teams, you have data scientists, you have a lot of rigor, you have a lot of tools, you have a lot of data. Uh, on the other side, maybe in SMBs or startups, uh, you don't have that. Maybe you don't have any dedicated people analytics. Maybe there's an HR operations person who is building dashboards and crunching data, you're, you're using, you know, macros in Excel or whatever you might have access to, um, to try to crunch the data. And so the first question I want to ask is when you, when you think about for companies, we'll, we'll kind of hit each of those sides of the spectrum and we'll start with the more advanced side first. What are the key kind of ingredients for a successful people analytics function in those, you know, enterprise type organizations that have dedicated teams? I'm going to say you need a really good people analytics leader, first of all. Um, And what do I mean by very good people analytics leader? Because there's many types of people analytics leaders out there. And you need one that is really aligned with what the CHRO or CPO wants to drive for the company, uh, who can influence the C-suite with data. That's really important. If this, for for example, some chief people officers are not data lovers, and if that's the case, um, you might have a hard time really getting anything done. If they fundamentally, you know, it's one thing to, to love data and, and, and believe in it, but it's another to be open-minded enough to take actions when the data challenges your beliefs. I think that is probably, I'll say the two components that are most important is one, have a great leader uh, who, who can uh, really, you know, bring in great talent to the team as the team grows. Um, and then two, a CHRO, CPO who is really aligned, right? Like their visions need to be aligned on what people analytics can do for the company. So, so if that sounds very abstract, I'll, I'll share an example, right? For, for instance, in the great resonation, a lot of chief people officers came to their, their, you know, people analytics team or HR ops team, if that's all they have and ask, you know, how can you help me? Please help me. We need to retain people. And of course, one of the first things that a manager would say is let's pay people more money and they will stay. Give them retention bonus, they will stay. Well, guess what? We were also running into economic slowdown. We were starting to see layoffs. Money was not all that abundant everywhere. So how do you make sure your precious dollars are used in the right place to retain talent? How do you create a strategy for engagement holistically that will work? That's what people analytics can do. Um, and, and so I think being really aligned, like the, the alignment between the head of people analytics and CHR is really important. Um, and, and I think I would say at this point, having done five global head of people analytics role, 
I would split that responsibility between the two, yeah. between the CHRO and the head of people analytics. I think the CHRO needs to be very open minded to new methods, new ways of looking at the data, being willing to invest in the function, not treat it like just reporting or compliance and so on. Um, and but also, you know, at, at the same time, stay curious enough to upskill yourself if you are not, you know, if you went to school and there was no people analytics at all at the time. Um, spend time, maybe treat your people analytics leader as your reverse mentor uh, and learn about data analytics. That's that's one way to do it. Um, and then also, I think on the people analytics leader to it's their responsibility to not only be able to use data well, but to be able to tell compelling stories with the data that would drive action. And number maybe this is number one uh, before that, to understand the business enough to solve problems that actually matter to the C-suite. Um, you know, I, I tell people on my team all the time, if you don't know what's keeping your clients up at night, right? And that could be an HR business partner, that could be a business, you know, a PNL leader, that could be the CEO. If you don't know what's keeping them up at night, you will end up solving the wrong problems that they don't care about. Um, and so I was able to grow my team in every organization I was at, despite the budget challenges. And I didn't do that with magic or, you know, my, uh, um, you know, some experience from before. It's, it's not how I did that. Um, I simply took a, a time that, um, you know, initially to understand the business, to understand what the pain points were, and then use data analytics to solve those problems, to quickly show Hey, I can predict who is going to leave next. Are you interested? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Invest in me. Right. This is what I need. I need a serious data scientist to keep this going. Because I did that stuff manually. I could continue to do it, but it's not scalable. Um, I can help you predict who's going to be the rainmaker in the sales organization that you just stood up. Are you interested? Great. I'm going to need the investment. That's how I treat the the people analytics function. So it's it's sort of um you know it's yes proving our early wins, but it's also more importantly understanding what's causing pain for the business so that we can drive revenue, profit, right? These concrete metrics that your CEO and CFO actually care about. Um, and if you can't speak the language, I think you know that's that's something else to upskill on. So. I'm very learning focused as a person. I always talk about you know, what else can I learn, and the same for my team. So if you are um, if you are getting started, that's that's definitely a, a place to invest your time before you can get them to invest in you. Yeah, I mean that's such a that's such a great point. And and let's kind of jump to the other side of the spectrum now. So um, startups, scale ups, SMBs, organizations that you know don't have a data analytics. Uh, you know, team, don't have a people analytics team. They're probably doing some things out of HR operations or, or even out of other functions specifically. What, what advice do you have for leaders of those, HR leaders of those organizations? So they want to bring more data capabilities and rigor into a smaller, leaner organization where they may not have budget, they may not have access to tools, and they may not have the, the expertise as, as a dedicated, you know, professional people analytics uh, person would, what are some steps they can take? Because I think that the people analytics as a function, you know, we've run, I think, eight cohorts now in the Amplify Academy. And I ask all the incoming students, hey, what do you grade yourself high at? What do you grade yourself low uh -huh. at? People analytics is always, always, all eight of them, the uh -huh. lowest uh, group that they do just because it is tends to be you. more specialized. So right. let's, let's help them. What advice do you have for, yeah. you know, those types of HR leaders, um, to, to begin kind of demystifying people analytics and making it more accessible. And then maybe even if you have any specific tangible things that they can do, sure. um, to bring more kind of data driven rigor into their programs, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so first of all, I, I would recommend that people think both short-term and long-term. Short-term, I would say, get started today. 
Don't wait and just get started on your people analytics journey, even if you've never done anything before. Um, and, and I'll share how, how to do that with some concrete examples. But at the same time, think long term as well, right? Meaning if you know you are in a growth mode and you're eventually going to get to, uh, let's call it 500 people company in size, or maybe even 250, 250 and above, you might eventually need some more dedicated resources dealing with people data who are experts who can who can answer questions quickly for you uh, then paint a, a, a pathway paint a picture that can eventually for you to attract someone who is great to come lead that function for you and it's never too late to get started on that talent attraction because uh, guess what there's very few of us <laughs> and uh, uh, and I know that when I'm in conversation with recruiters for our companies are looking for heads of people analytics um, I you know it, it's sort of like it's the same. 10 of us who might be on the final slate. So, so it's very rare talent, right? If you need to find people like that. Um, so then, you know, start cultivating an, a, a brand for your company that is data focused, that will help you attract eventually a great people analytics leader to join you. Okay, so back to the short term, what can you do today? Well, for a lot of companies that are startups, hiring is one of the most important things for them, right? Uh, even if you don't have the budget like a giant company, even if you're not hiring a thousand racks a year, guess what? Every hire you make is super critical because there's not very many of you yet. So you want to make a great decision when it comes to hiring. I would say that's a great example and great area to focus on for your people people analytics. Um, you can look at historically, let's say you're hiring you know, yet another salesperson or yet another engineer. Look at your past processes, look at your past hires. What makes someone successful? What makes someone unsuccessful? If you have made a great hire, right, you can start to see patterns by looking at historically where the hires came from, right? Whether that's uh, you know how they were sourced, where they went to school, if they went to school, um, what kind of majors and so on. So you can look at some the data that you have. Um, you can also look at how they were onboarded, right? Um, I think onboarding is something a lot of people, a lot of companies get wrong, but it's so critical and it's so difficult to get right. So, you know, is the onboarding process different for your successful hires versus the not less successful hires recently? Um, and basically figure out the recipe that produce a great higher and then go out there, go out there to the market and search for those people and change your process if you need to so that you can get more in. Because hiring is the most important and most expensive decision you will make yeah. as a small business. Uh, if you make the wrong hire, I don't need to paint a picture for you for that. You know what happens. It's really painful for everyone involved, including the hire themselves. Yeah. So, so how can you avoid that expensive mistake and actually get talent that would drive your, you know, top line or innovation for your company? Uh, that's really important. Um, I do think another underutilized data set is any sort of employee feedback or even candidate experience feedback. Um, if you're a company that does any of that feedback gathering throughout the process, um, I'm sad to share that a lot of times I talk to companies and the data just sits there. It's unused, untouched completely because they don't have the time because they don't, you know, they don't know what problem to solve for. Well, um, if you have something during the hiring process, you know what you can use that data for. See what work, what's working well, see what's not working well. And then again, tie it to the hires who, who are making great impact um, and, and see. So, so I think sometimes the small businesses run into uh, small sample size problems, right? Like maybe I've only hired two engineers last year and one is great and one is terrible. What do I do with that? Right. Well, <laughs> uh, sometimes you do need a little bit bit more data. And then um, I think in those kind of sample size of two situation, you do need the art and science of people analytics. You need the intuition and data combined because you only have sample size of two. You can't, you can't identify patterns. Um, so, you know, trust your, uh, this will sound strange coming from me, but trust your gut. <laughs> if your gut is telling you that the terrible hire was actually just an outlier, and you did a great job hiring engineers, 
great. If your gut is telling you that uh, you got really lucky with that one good hire, despite everything that went wrong, trust your gut as well. Yeah. So, you know, when you don't have the funnel that I was talking about at the beginning of the, the conversation, because you don't have thousands of people at the beginning of the funnel that you get to, you know, one person that you hire at the end, where you can uh, identify issues throughout different parts of the recruiting process. If you can't do that, that's okay. Um, and then finally, since we are human resources, uh, talk to the humans too. <laughs> Don't forget, you can always talk to the humans in the process, whether it's someone who was hired, ask them, what made you successful? Right? If you don't have a survey to capture it, it's one quick call uh, or, um, you know, uh, or you can do it uh, through messages and see what made them successful. What, you know, you're performing really well. seems like you love the environment. You're really thriving. Uh, and we want to make sure the new people we bring on board have a similar experience, you know, help, help us out here. So um, lots of ways to get that data um, and I would say, finally, my encouragement is even if you find out that you don't have the data to get started, it's okay. Don't forget you can always collect the data. And then next year, <laughs> you, can, you can mine the data and uh, you will have fruit once you plant the <laughs> seeds this year. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I'm I'm appreciate you giving tangible examples there, and I, I think too, like we you know we talk about employee surveys. Obviously, we talk about uh, candidate experience surveys, and you know more people should do those. But also recent hire surveys, because I think there's a lot of data. Yes. Obviously, those are people that have just been through a recruiting process. Chances are they're probably recruiting elsewhere as well. How did they find you? Why did they choose you? Yeah. What did they think about the interview process? What right. was their onboarding like? What would they have, um, what would have helped them be more effective? in yeah. that process. Like those are all easy questions you can ask and you don't need a, a you know, sophisticated tool to do that. You could use a, you know, yeah. Google, you know, survey, you could use Typeform, yeah. you could use whatever you need, but that is really rich data because it'll help inform what you're doing well, what you can optimize. And so again, yeah. I, I love the low totally. kind of stakes, um, yes. you know, examples that, that people can actually yeah. do now that you don't need data sciences to actually do that can impact your business. Right. Absolutely. Um, and Lars, I, I'm curious if you have a favorite question on the recent hire survey, because it's secretly my favorite survey of all. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yes. I, I like, uh, also the, the employer brand person in me, Ooh, like okay. I, I like, how did you discover mm -hmm. us? Uh, Ooh, I like yeah. understanding. So I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give you a couple. I, I like how, <laughs> how did you discover us? Um, mm -hmm. I like, how did you research us? So like, once you discovered mm -hmm. us, you probably leveraged a few tools to learn more about us. Yeah. What were those? Um, yeah. and then also how did your, um, how were the expectations that were set for you about the role and the environment mm -hmm. and the team, uh, align with your actual experience when you came? So really kind of understanding, you know, are, how are they finding mm -hmm. us? How are they vetting us? And is what we're presenting to them aligned with what the actual job yes. is, or is there a potential misalignment there? Uh, so Love it's your it. favorite survey. What, what's your favorite? Do you have a, a favorite? Oh my gosh. I'll, I'll give you a couple. I, I won't peg you down to one because uh, you know no, I couldn't no, give you just no, one. No, it's it's okay. And actually, uh, we're gonna save us some time because your favorite one is actually also my favorite one. Uh, I really love the one around expectations. Yeah. And the reason is, um, I also of course check on the exit interview surveys. And oftentimes the signals I find on people's way out is this is not what I signed up for. When people have that comment of this is not what I signed up for within the first six months, you can pretty much guarantee they're out the door within a year or two at most. Um, why? Because fundamentally we don't enjoy being lied to and, and that feels like a lie. Um, and of course, business could change, right? But if I join a company and you tell me I'm going to lead a team of 20 and I only get budget for five, well, that's a big difference. Or if you tell me I'm going to report to the head of HR and suddenly I'm not reporting to the head of TA, who was a great person, but that is not what we talked about. So, so I think a lot of times those fundamental things, and it doesn't have to be those you know, large uh, changes I described, but it could be something smaller. Um, but when people don't feel good, like, like they are being lied to initially, they quickly lose the trust. 
which I think is the most important currency in any organization these days. Can you trust your employer? Can you trust your manager? Um, and and so so I think that's that's one that I will always ask um, is the comparison of what you were promised versus what was delivered to you. Um, I think the second one I like a lot is around role clarity. So this is something I would ask not in week one, but uh, probably at least one month to two months, uh, at most three months, right? Uh, you might need some time, especially if it's a senior role, a chance to get to know people before you know what your day-to-day -day is like and, and your goals for the year. That's fair. Um, you probably, you may have some idea in week one, but if by, let's say, month three, you have zero clue what you're supposed to do to be successful in your role or what you're supposed to deliver. Something has gone awfully wrong yeah. during either the recruiting process or the onboarding process. Uh, so, so, um, so I think those two would be my favorites. Um, and, and like I said, I think the key for, for me in, in learning along the way as a head of people analytics is to try to tie that to other surveys. Like the example I gave were, you know, how do I know that people who responded unfavorably on something like, uh, that, you know, everything, um, I was promised, uh, was, you know, or they met my expectations and what have you, how do I know those people exit? It's because I'm able to track the group over time. Now, all the surveys I've done are confidential. So, um, so, you know, the third party will hold the, the identities and IDs of these employees, but they can tell me over time, Hey, a year later, this subgroup left, this subgroup is still here. Um, that's how I know what is working and what is not working. And that's really powerful and simple analysis that you can do without any kind of Python knowledge, okay? <laughs> without any statistics. Right? It is this group left. What's different uh, from this group that is here? And, and so, yeah, so I give that as an example and hopefully encouragement for people to get started with your new hire survey because it's, it's one of the easiest things and probably uh, very valuable and will give you insights you've never thought about before. <laughs> Great. Well, you, you've already made uh, our people in like teams and capabilities a bit more capable. So I, I appreciate that. And, and I want to we're going to go to the lightning round in a second to help the uh, redefiners get to know you a little bit better. But I have one more quick question I want to sneak in before uh, the lightning round. Quality of hire. Right. I think Oof. that this is a uh, the gold metric, right, that we yes. all want to know. There is a range of uh, thoughts and ideas on how we measure it. I want to kind of stay in the camp of the startup scale ups, SMBs, again, the teams that may not have the level of sophistication, data rigor, people analytics, data scientists, et cetera, that the bigger companies have, you know, let's focus on, you know, the, the smaller companies. What advice do you have for people teams in those organizations to measure quality of hire? How should they think about that? And, and it, it, it may be more yeah. than one and that's okay too. So if there's sure. a, a couple, like whatever tips you may have, how, how can yeah. they get better at measuring quality of hire? Right. I would ask a tough question of why do you want to know about quality of hire in the first place? And I don't ask that to be difficult. I ask that to ask, to make you think about what you would do once you get that data. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you are willing to change up your recruiting process completely so that you can improve your quality of hire? If you find out your managers are simply terrible in onboarding, are you willing to require them to go through different kind of training so that they will invest the time in their new hires? If your answer is an, a resounding yes, I'm willing to do those changes, don't bother, okay? Yeah. And I speak from experience because every people analytics team has been given this difficult job of measuring quality of hire. And a significant portion of those people in the analytics team have also been faced with we gave a lot of leaders insights and they refused to do anything with it because the actions were not palatable to the organization. No manager wants to go to additional training to make the onboarding better. 
Well, then, <laughs> then why ask about it? So, anyways, so I think one is being very clear on what actions you will take once you have the data, uh, and it could be training, it could be something else, it could be a revamp. But make sure you do have the resources and willingness to change. So that's number one. Um, and then, as far as the metrics, I think it, it's going to have to depend on the industry. I wish there was something as simple as well, go do this, and then you can figure it out. But because the performance and productivity are measured differently from one job to another, from one function to another. There is not a single easy way to um, that is going to be good you know, on a blanket type of basis. Um, I certainly recommend that you check out my course. I do cover the quality of hire in my LinkedIn learning course on people analytics. Um, so there's generally either a a single metric approach or an index approach. A single metric approach means you have one quality of hire metric, right? So let's call it retention. As well, with how we're going to measure quality or higher. The longer you are here, the higher quality we think you are. Or you can use performance. Um, you know, whether that's a one to five rating or something else, you could do that. Um, you could say time to promotion. If people do get promoted fairly quickly, that could be one that you use. Um, but you know, one single metric, and you say that's our quality of hire for our company. Um, alternatively, you can say, you know what, all those things matter. I'm going to create an index that is weighted by, you know, one third, one third, one third, hypothetically, because they are equally important to our business. We want retention, we want performance, and then so on. So you can use those um, and combine them into an index as well. More complicated, probably, if you have a, you know, small team or no team, uh, start with something simpler. Um, but most importantly, make sure there is alignment at, at the senior level. So you don't get into a conversation of, oh, quality of hire has improved, we've done great things. And then the leader goes, oh, I don't think that's how we should measure quality of hire. Yeah. <laughs> so, so make sure there's alignment on, on that before you implement any changes, any programs to improve that particular metric. Great. Well, Serena, I appreciate you, you know, sharing your deep people analytics with us uh, on the podcast today. If people want to get to know more about your kind of services um, at Learn to Love Data with Serena, I'm going to give you the whole name. Uh, yes. What's the best? How, where can they find you online? Uh, definitely, you can find me on LinkedIn or check my, my new website, datawithserena.com. Um, and you can book me directly there as well if you want some time for me to coach you on how to level up your personal brand on LinkedIn. Happy to do that. Um, and certainly, I look forward to seeing more people in my data storytelling workshops in the future. Very cool. We close out every episode with a brief lightning round to help the uh, the audience get to know you a little bit more. And so we start with music. Uh, what was your first concert? Oh, geez. Uh, I think it was One Direction. <laughs> One, all right. Okay. Um, next question. What was your latest uh, binge on TV or kind of streaming, uh, streaming TV watching? Uh, oh, my goodness. This is going to sound really weird. Um... <laughs> I want everyone to know this, but oh well, here you go. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Disclaimer, share what you're comfortable sharing. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna extract any information that you're not uh, not comfortable sharing in a in a very public forum. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh okay. Yeah. So I love the um I love the show Friends from <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to see the originals, and uh, uh, and yeah, and I've been watching essentially <laughs> the seasons that I really enjoy. You know, that's <laughs> not that embarrassing. That's not that. I mean, trust me. That's you, you okay. can you can do a lot worse than friends. So, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and uh, last question for you: What is bringing you joy lately? Definitely my puppy. Uh, she is a six months old Yorkie and oh, brings wow. me tremendous joy uh, after she's finally sleeping through the night. Thank goodness. Um, and I think the the recent seven cities in five week tour on data with Serena uh, that allowed me to see a lot of my followers in person and chat data in real life um, brought me a lot of joy as well. All right. Well, Serena, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom, your experience, giving us some real practical tips. Uh, and again, if you want to go deeper, check out data with Serena.com and the Serena's LinkedIn learning, uh, and a lot of other content. You're pretty prolific on the content side. So there's a lot to, uh, to learn from. So thank you for, uh, for sharing so openly. 
Thank you. Thank you.